Hello everyone, this is Jeff Besson with Intua Lab, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to IntuaFace version 5.7, probably the last new feature release before we jump to 6.0, <laughs> so this is a big deal. Uh, in this overview, I'll talk about the brand new scroll collection. We'll review speech recognition for Windows PCs. I'll show you toggle button sets. Uh, this will enable you to create what some of you know as a radio button. Uh, I'll talk about the new data tracking connector for Google Analytics. You'll be able to upload data points to Google Analytics for analysis. Uh, I'll briefly talk about our support for the brand new Tizen powered Samsung smart signage platform. Uh, Samsung calls that the SSSP4. And finally, some additional improvements, often uh, items that have uh, come to us by way of popular request. So some of you are dying for these things, and for some of you, you have no idea what we're talking about. But uh, one day you'll, you'll uh, ask for it. All right, great. Let's start by talking about the scroll collection. So here we are in Composer. Let me just start by talking about what the heck a scroll collection is. Imagine a canvas. The canvas has on it an assortment of images, videos, documents, maps, other types of interface collections. And in front of this canvas, you put a window, a window that is smaller than the canvas. Finally, I can use my hand to push the canvas in any direction behind the window, revealing different parts of that canvas. That's the scroll collection. I have a variety of examples in this demonstration, but I'm going to build one for you, which concerns the use of a panoramic image. It's, a, it's possibly a, a classic use of IntuaFace, which is to show an image larger than the screen and enabling someone to browse through that image. And, and panoramic images typically are that, much, much broader than your screen. So let's show that in action. Uh, we'll start by adding a scroll collection to this scene. Uh, when it starts, there's not much to see. It's an empty collection, right? So I've made it a little bigger, heading on over to my content library and dragging in a panoramic image. Let me then make this image the size of the scroll collection. So I'll just snap it to the edges there. And in play mode, our users will be able to swipe this left and right. You see that? Before we go into play mode, let me add a couple of markers here. You can think of these as maybe placeholders you would put to indicate areas of interest. Uh, maybe even put signage in there or something like that so that people can identify aspects of the image based on your labels. So there we go. We have inside the scroll collection. You can see it here in the scene structure panel inside the scroll collection. I have two of those uh, X's and then the panoramic image. Below the scroll collection entirely is this guy. See that? It's a little box. What I'd like to do is illustrate one other function of the scroll collection, which is a notion of offset. It's how far the scroll collection has been scrolled. Once you get used to this notion of offset, you're going to use it a lot. In my other examples in this demonstration, you'll see that offset put to use. Right now, what I'd like to have happen is that when we reach a certain offset, this box will jump up top. So the question is, what offset? Well, if I look at the position of this particular image in the scroll collection, its x-axis is 912. Now that's in relation to what we call the offset origin, which by default is the upper left-hand corner of the viewport of that window. So this is 912 pixels over from this. So that box was a little more, right? So we'll say the offset of the box is, I don't know, 1100, just for sake of discussion. So if I pick the scroll collection itself, let's add a trigger which is when the horizontal scroll is more than pixels, 1,050 pixels. So when the horizontal offset is more than 1,050, then we'll take the group and move it up. And this little feature lets me specify where to move it to. So we'll just move it here, right? OK. We're done play. First, we have my panoramic image. It's inside the scroll collection. See how I can move it around? You see that? Then when I reach a certain offset, boom, up jumps the box. Now you can constrain which directions you can scroll. Maybe you only want people to scroll left and right or up and down. And thanks to the use of the offset, you can create some really cool effects. Let's look at a few others. 
this is a lot like a website. So if I have a web page, it could be very long, and I'm scrolling through that web page. Let me use my finger here and scroll up the page to introduce new content, all of which, all of this dynam dynamicity, for example, those images dropping in or these images appearing, all of this is in relation to the use of the offset. When the offset is at a certain value, then do whatever you want, any set of actions. Here's another example. The parallax effect, that's where you have multiple layers, one in front of the other, and the farther back the layer is, the slower it moves, right? So as I drag my finger to the left, notice the waves move quickly, but the boat moves a little slower, and there are some items that are moving even slower than that. You see that? So that's the parallax effect, which is really just a bunch of layers, different scroll collections where you're using the offset to say, when this moves 100, move this one 50, move that other one 25, see what I mean? Then it becomes very simple to reproduce. Another example is scrollable text. We get asked about this a lot. If I have a lot of text that's larger than the window within which it's visible, can I make, enable people to scroll it? Well, with the scroll collection, it's a piece of cake. You just take your scroll, your, your text asset, put it inside a scroll collection whose window is smaller than the text asset, and then let people swipe their way through it. Much easier now with the scroll collection. Finally, some other examples of cool effects you can create thanks to the scroll collection. Here we modify the opacity of this text based on the vertical offset. See that? If we go further, let's compress the burger. See that? As I increase or decrease the offset, I'm closing and opening the items in that burger. Or here we have flying in from all corners some letters. Again, all thanks to the notion of an offset. So with a little bit of practice, you can come up with some really awesome effects. Okay, experts, <laughs> now that you know the scroll collection, let's go to the next topic, which is speech recognition. This feature was introduced uh, on uh, Windows only, and the reason is because we're able to leverage the Windows Speech Recognition API. So we didn't build our own Speech Recognition API. We're leveraging Windows to do that. The idea is that with the, the new Speech Recognition capability of Intuaface, it can recognize any expression, and you can use that recognition as a trigger. Once the text you specify is recognized, then do X. So in this case, the bottom right-hand corner will reveal, will reveal information when I, for example, say, how's the weather in Chicago? Watch this. How is the weather in Chicago? There we go. We have the weather in Chicago. Uh, see the bottom left? Go to, and I can pick any items. Let's say New York Times. Go to New York Times. And there's the New York Times website. In the upper right-hand corner, uh, it's going to change the color of the text change me to. Watch the text change me to. Change me to green. See that? So there are multiple speech recognition interface assets, each of which is looking for different expressions. All of those expressions can be used to trigger different sets of actions. Pretty awesome. Next, toggle button sets. So we, we've had a toggle button before. There's been toggle buttons in Intuaface for a while. Uh, the, the idea of a toggle button is that it, is it has two states. The toggle button can be checked or it can be unchecked. So for example, if I uncheck toggle three, then the associated item that I'm toggling visibility based on the state of these buttons. So if I touch toggle three, that's checked. If I touch toggle three, it's unchecked. If I touch toggle one, it's checked. If I touch toggle one again, it's unchecked. So the, the toggle button has a notion of checked and unchecked. The problem is, is that no toggle buttons were aware of anyone else. If I check toggle one, and I check toggle two, and I check toggle three, they're all on at the same time. Wouldn't it be nice to create the notion of exclusive on, where I have a set of buttons, of toggle buttons, and only one can be on at a time? That's what a toggle button set is. Let me show you how to build it. That's pretty simple. Toggle button sets. OK. Whoops. So here's our three buttons. Let me highlight them in the Scene Structure panel. Right-click, Show Properties. And on the Behavior tab of our Properties panel, let's add them all into a toggle set. And we can give it a name, Photo Toggle. It really doesn't matter what we call it. So because they're in a set, 
It's an exclusive check. Only one item can be checked. Only one button can be checked at a time. You also have the option of specifying whether you want to allow all of them to be unchecked. So by default, one insists on being checked. You can change that. But all I've done is add them to a set. Let's go to play. Now, when I touch toggle one, it unchecks toggle three. When I check toggle two, it unchecks toggle one. It's an exclusive toggle button, which some of you might think of as a radio button. That's how you, you would create a radio button by using a toggle button set. Very easy to implement and very powerful. OK, Google Analytics. Now, a little background first. Some of you are probably familiar with Google Analytics as it pertains to web analytics. For years, one could use uh, Google Analytics to track visitors. What pages are they visiting? How long do they visit? Well, things of that nature. Uh, give or take uh, six months to a year ago, I'm not exactly sure when, Google expanded Google Analytics to accommodate not just websites, but mobile applications. In other words, I can create a mobile application that creates information captured and stored and analyzed by Google Analytics. We've leveraged that capability. When you use the data tracking feature of IntuitFace to capture information about what people are doing, who they are, other environmental information, when you're using the data tracking feature to capture that information and you want to analyze it, we now have a connector enabling you to take that information and push it up to Google Analytics. My guess is not many of you are familiar with Google Analytics, and, and this is not a place to teach you all the details, but let me just give you a high-level view of the kind of things that are possible. So for example, you can get a, a real-time view. Now, there's right now, nobody's using the experiences monitored by this particular account, so there's nobody here. But just like you can in real-time have used Google Analytics to see Who's on our website right now? What are they doing right now? You can do the same with all of your players on all of your devices all over the world. You can collect all that information in Google Analytics and in real time, take a look and see what people are doing. Another example is, is referred to as User Explorer in Google Analytics. In this case, each user is a device. This is the way it works with our connector. Every device running Composer or player is a quote unquote user. Each one of these rows is a user. In fact, what you're seeing is a license key. So these are all the license keys associated with Composer and Player. From Google Analytics perspective, it's different users. And you can see what each device, what's happening on each device. Another example of how to use Google Analytics is what's referred to as the behavior flow. What are people doing first? What are people doing second? What are people doing third? So this gives you a sense of the order, how people are interacting with your experience. In what order are they starting? Where do they go to second? Where do they go to third? And all the time you can filter based on session. Session becomes a very important notion when using Google Analytics. You can use it to differentiate one user from another on the same device. And you'll notice this, this is an agglomeration of 600 sessions. This is an agglomeration of 497 sessions. So these are all of the sessions across all of the devices. You can then filter this using analytics. Analytics, Google Analytics is very powerful. And thanks to our connector, you can take all of that information you're collecting from your composer and player devices, bring it up to Google Analytics and analyze it to get very actionable insight about your users and what they're doing. The Samsung Smart Signage Platform. So that's the next topic. We, we've supported the SSSP3 for over a year now. Samsung decided they want to revamp the operating system used on that device. The, the device is an all-in-one. You can think of it as an all-in-one. It had a system on a chip. In other words, it had an embedded operating system directly in the display. So all you had to do is plug the, the display into a power outlet, and you're done, and it's working. And then you take an Ethernet cable, and, and it's connected to the Internet. There's nothing else to do. So it's, it's a, a very good total cost of ownership. Samsung decided they wanted to improve the operating system on the SSP. And they built what they called the Tizen operating system, which is not unique to the SSP. You, you'd also find it on uh, smart TVs from Samsung. 
So the triple SP4 features the Tizen operating system. We support that as well. You can now run into a face player, specifically player for kiosks, on the SSSP4. Samsung is currently shipping the SSSP without a touch overlay, which means if you want to use into a face, you can use a mouse or a keyboard, but you can't use a touch screen yet because Samsung isn't shipping it yet. Our understanding is that there'll be a projected capacitive version of the Tizen-based triple SP4 shipping early in 2017. And when that's done, we'll support that as well. You can use the touch screen with the triple SP4. All right, the final topic were some additional improvements we've added in, in version 5.7. Again, for some of you, this is a lifesaver. You've been asking for this for a while. For others, you didn't know about this, you know, but one day you might find it valuable. For example, the launch application action and the call, URL, uh, the, the, uh, and the call URL action didn't have bindable parameters. In other words, you had to define at edit time what you wanted to launch or what URL you wanted to call. That's no longer the case. You can bind it to an external source, so that can be determined at runtime. We've decided that for the data tracking feature of IntuaFace, we're going to let Composer's Play Mode generate an unlimited number of data points. Previous to version 5.7, there was a 1,000 data point cap for each account, whether you use Composer's Play Mode or Player. That is no longer the case. Composer no longer consumes uh, your data point limit. That's only player. So from now on, if you're using Composer's play mode, you can generate an infinite number of data points. It's with player specifically that you need to buy a data plan if you want to exceed a thousand data points per month per account. Uh, this has been requested more than you'd think. People will cancel a subscription uh, or they, they, they jump the gun and then realize that was a mistake. And we do give people the ability now to go online and resume a subscription rather than having to buy a new license with a new key. By resuming a subscription, it's the same key. It makes the process a little smoother. For those of you building custom interface assets, if, you, if you're using .NET, one of the frustrations is there was no simple way to write log messages for yourself. And starting with 5.7, you can actually write to composer and player's log files. And for those of you who don't write in interface assets, the, the idea here is that the developer can speak to themselves. They can talk about what's happening and record that information in the log so they can troubleshoot why things may not be working the way they expected it. Finally, this is a small improvement, but in fact, I think can be quite helpful. Starting in 5.7, if you go to the uh, Help About panel, so you've opened the About panel for Composer or for Player, it will give you additional information about the license, including when it expires so you have a good understanding within the products what license you're using and how much longer you have with that license before there's a renewal or, or an expiration. That's it. That's a lot, right? So IntuaFace version 5.7 is ready to go. You can download it right away. Uh, and I hope you enjoy all the hard work we put into it. Thanks so much for watching, everyone.